I just want to welcome you to Mary, who I worked with for decades <laughs> at The Guardian, who is an amazing journalist. And she was an amazing NUJ leader, which is the National Union of Journalists, and an amazing bloody person. She was also amazing in marketing when she was a very young person. If you ever want to ask her about that, she was a <laughs> fucking brilliant businesswoman. <laughs> yeah. And as for Danny Dorling, Danny Dorling was in fact the subject of a Guardian leader. Yeah. In praise of Danny Dorling. <laughs> Admittedly, it was 14 years ago. Oh. <laughs> God knows what to say now. Eh? <laughs> um, anyway, it says there is another L word that matters far more and which barely gets a sorry, there is another I word that matters far more and which barely gets a mention inequality. Thank goodness then for Danny Dorling, who has spent the 20, past 20 years studying the wealth gap. And he is a real expert, as is Mary, of course, whose brilliant book, Austerity Bites, is kind of has been updated. And also what I love about Austerity Bites is that it kind of I've got the title right, haven't I? <laughs> so the brilliant thing about the title is that like it obviously gets to the heart of austerity, but sounds like an amazing horror film. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of it is. Well it is based on a film, it comes yeah. to reality bites. Um so I want to, I mean, these questions will be basic and direct to both of you. I'm going to start with you, Danny. Uh, what shocked you most about austerity as a policy? And it's weird because austerity used to be a word, and now it's austerity in quotes as a thing, a yeah. policy, an intended thing. Uh, i trying to think what shocked me the most. The, the problem is you become cold to this. You know, every year you become used to uh, how it is. Every time you hear a new statistic, you know, majority of children with a brother and sister are going hungry several times a month. It's a shock. And then it's reality. Um, I think it was the glee that George Osborne appeared to take in doing it. I think that was the thing that shocked me the most. He seemed to be proud of being the architect and the main engineer of austerity. And I can remember the point at which he left, le left office and he went on a holiday to Vietnam. This was reported in the Mail, but also the Guardian, I think. He went to one of those ranges where you can get a machine gun and just shoot off rounds and pretend you're, you're in the Vietnam War in Vietnam. And the bullets cost, reportedly, a pound a bullet. And the fact that the, the man who did this to people in the country then, and he knew he would be reported, just fired away hundreds and thousands of pounds to celebrate no longer being Chancellor of the Exchequer. You know, it's, that, it's that callousness uh, that really shocked me the most because I thought there would be a level they wouldn't go beneath, the point that they would stop. Uh, and I, I still don't know where that comes from. So I've lowered the tone, I'm afraid, down. But it, that's the biggest shock. I think you can lower the tone now. It's yeah. low to me. Yeah. Um, if anybody has read, by the way, about a potential takeover of the Observer by Tortoise, I don't know if you have, but the guy who runs Tortoise just happens to be George Osborne's best friend. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a small world. Um, I think kind of it did. It, what shocked me also didn't shock me, if you get my drift. So when I first started on this sort of austerity research and I was going around the country, I was looking less at data and more at individual experiences of what was happening and trying to take a temperature of people's feelings and worries and concerns. Um, I think I was desperately shocked at just how much was going to happen, how fast. So we were being given indicators, but there was still a sense of not quite believing what was coming was going to come. And it just came so fast, like a whole parts of the welfare system were being dismantled very, very quickly. The stuff that people had come to rely on. So like, like emergency loans, if your family ran into trouble and you could go to the council and get an emergency loan and it 
literally was a thing that meant that you could still put food on the table because you didn't have to go and do that. There, there were just so many things happening on so many aspects of the welfare state that it was absolutely, I mean, for me, it felt like the ground shaking beneath our feet. The problem, what, what shocked me most after that was the fact that the culture wasn't responding to it. So I found myself finding out all, all this information, but I wasn't seeing it reported in the media. And so it would be a few years before the press took it seriously and started challenging austerity, seriously challenging it and acknowledging how destructive it was. Um, I genuinely thought after having interviewed people and looked at it that journalists would be all over it like a rash and it didn't happen. And that was disappointing as well as shocking. I find it shocking the kind of acceptance mm. of the word that it had to be imposed. Yeah. And it was overt. I mean, if you were playing devil's advocate, mm. could you give us a devil's advocate argument for saying it was ever necessary? No. Well, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, you're at university, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, you're clever now. I mean, we're clever. <laughs> <laughs> In a kind of slightly. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think there was a lot of rationale, but not like. No, 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 no. no. There wasn't much. It was very, you know, they won that election. Well, they didn't. Uh, it was tied. Mm. Gus O'Donnell told them, I think it was, that they had a weekend to agree, otherwise the pound was going to collapse. Mm. Uh, Gordon Brown wasn't very good at getting on with people. So we end up with Cameron and, and Clegg. You know, two identikit. They'd learned to take their shirts off, and, but they still had cufflinks. Um, and it, you remember this was done with liberals. You know, that's, that's worth remembering. Although poor old Sarah Tever ended up collapsing in tears at what she was told to do as, as a minister mm. and, and going. Uh, the story about whether it's necessary, you hark back to the post-1945 austerity we had after the Second World War, which lasted with rationing from 1952. But that was everybody, or almost everybody, taking part and particularly affected the rich who had to get utility furniture. And unless they ate out, they were still on rations. And those rations were better for children on average than the children had got before the war, so the children got taller. So our previous austerity, the post-war austerity, wasn't all in it together. This wasn't. This is we're going to stuff the people who have to ask for an emergency loan. Mm. I mean, it was just vindictive and nasty. But they did say, didn't they, Danny, at the time, when you're looking at the rhetoric of it, it became very clear that the poor bore the brunt of it, right? Yeah. So people who were already struggling bore the brunt of it. But they had this wonderful sort of rhetorical kind of, yeah, you know, thing that they use. Of course, we've all got to tighten our belts. You know, we're all in the same boat. It's mm -hmm. like, so they pretended it was a similar kind of austerity, but actually the consequences of it were... Like yeah. in, for inequality, it's dark as hell. Yeah, they, they, they were terrible. And I mean, maybe they didn't know. I always wonder about this. It's, it's, to what extent were they stupid and to what extent were they nasty? We had, for the best of 10%, the lowest income tax rate in Europe, essentially. Very tiny wealth taxes, lots of money in this country. It is possible, and these men, largely men, are men of my age. They were in my town. I grew up in Oxford. I didn't like them when I was 16. They were in my town at the same time as me. You've got to think, these are teenagers in 1983, 4 and 5, who in those years, if you're old enough to understand this, decided that they were going to like Margaret Thatcher at 18, 19 or 20. Okay, so it's a strange, strange group wearing the frock coats getting beaten up by the locals, which probably damaged them. Um, you sound empathetic, do not you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, you can do, I mean, you can try and do the empathy, or try to, try to understand them. You know, you turn up, your name was Gideon, but you changed it to George. You went to Westminster, so it wasn't Eton, but you get in with your chums because you've got enough money from the wallpaper factory, you know. And there's Dave and, and the rest of you. And you all tell each other that you're the clever ones, the tall poppies destined to rule, because why else would you have £30,000 a year spent on your education? 
you get your two ones or, or yeah. your first from Maudlin or Brazenose or whatever. You get your place at, was it Cameron? I've forgotten the TV company that Dave went to at 21. You learn to call yourself Dave. Oh, and you Carlton, even, did he go to Carlton? Carlton TV. Yeah. Carlton TV. You go slightly down the Cowley Road and you smoke a tiny bit of a spliff and aren't you cool? But for an Eaton boy, that was. You then have a protected and absolutely charmed life in the late 1980s and 90s in London. The woman you marry literally owns an estate, a large one. And not a council estate. No. <laughs> and the rest, and they're this isolated bubble. I could have been like, you know, by luck, I went in the opposite direction. In 1986, I went to Newcastle University. And for 10 years, I lived in Newcastle, where 65% of people, and I learned to say Newcastle, where 65% of people have no work. They never saw this. They never saw the repercussions of what, of what was going on. It was dinner parties and affairs and, you know, nannies and au pairs and money and inheritance and trust funds and trying to work out how to get enough money themselves to send the children to the schools that they'd gone to. So they, they, they were so ignorant of society that they thought that they could stop people having children by introducing a two-child policy. They thought that people actually, just before they were about to have a shag, could go, oh no, <laughs> you know, we've already had two. You know, it, it, um, okay, we've had academic papers showing that, mm. you know, but it's fairly obvious. But what kind of mindset, what kind of man thinks, I'm gonna take away child benefit and that'll stop the lower orders procreating because they're not good for productivity. Because some idiot of an economics teacher when I was a teenager, I mean, it, there, there is a sadness. And we are worse than every other European mm. country at this. Mm. And it's because of our elite education system and our elite schools, and very sadly, my university that they all went to. Right? So we, we have a guilt and a have to start to address. And we're teaching people that they're special. Other people aren't. And the worst of it is, if we make them hungry, or we make their children hungry, they will work harder, they will take that second or third job, they will take the driving the Amazon van and working in the bar at night or something else, because all they know is to be treated like that, and like us, who are the brains, who you have to trust, and you can't trust the voting public. And, and that, that just became Yeah, but they obvious. wanted to finish Thatcher's work, right? So they, you know, they idolised her, um, but yeah. they knew that she hadn't gone far enough. Yeah. They, they definitely wanted to finish the job that she started. And some, when you look at some of the policies around austerity, I mean, it was stuff that Thatcher wouldn't have touched, right? I mean, yeah. she, you know, she, she, for my generation, for our generation, certainly, she was like the demon queen of... Um, yeah of the right, but actually there were things that she wouldn't have gone near that these guys just took a scythe to yeah. and didn't give a flying fuck, frankly. Yeah, my, my local council only has 600 employees now, Oxford. Mm. Right? My geography department, we've got 500. Well, at some point we're gonna cross over. Geography department at Oxford will have more employees than the city council running the, well, the, the, the whole city. What did the council have at its kind of peak? <laughs> uh, two to three times as many, but it's also the things like our bins have been thrown out as an arm's length company, right? All these arm's length companies that are out. Um, but there is a thing, isn't there, Danny, with the austerity stuff that I think when you're, um, when you're in this country and this is your main political space, it's understandable that you look at your national politics and you try to dissect it and the issues that affect you and everybody else are within your own country. Um, when you're caught up in that, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is the only way to do things, right? Mm. If it's repeated enough, you start to believe it. Who has the time in their day to dissect this other than people whose job it is yeah. to dissect it? But the fact is that the trope that they used after the financial crisis was, that, you know, we have no choice. There's nothing we can do. Labour were a crock of shit when it came to challenging that narrative and let it lie so they could run with it and roll with mm. it. That's not necessarily what was happening in other countries. No, no. So the British public were led to think, shit, okay, now we've all got to tighten our belts. We're just going to have to take a hit. In the first couple of years, people go, okay, maybe that's right, maybe we'll do it. Five years later, they start to go, hold on a minute. They're suddenly like, 
no like nursery place for my kid. Half the shore starts have closed down. Why is there 15 food banks in my town? You know, yeah. they start to begin to see yeah, but, what but, happened. But, but that that didn't happen everywhere. Yeah, but all the shop, but eventually, all. All the shorts. Oh yeah, I've been go. told that thing's gonna heckle us, so we just got to right. <laughs> But it keeps us cold. I thought that was a hell of an indigestion. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I, last time I mentioned Oxford, like Oxford, affluent Please. town, affluent town. We're left with one child centre working, Donington doorstep. That's it, the last one. Started forty years ago. Everything else has gone, and there isn't enough money for this one. Um, so even in places which are not going bankrupt and like nearby councils Birmingham going bankrupt mm. you know it it is so we've drink on about it but it is staggering and it's happened nowhere else on the continent no. uh, has has done this and they've kind of got away with it largely because we have a current government mm. where it will kind of hold it here but we'll be a bit like them but nicer and until that changes they've won do Look, you when you've got. Oh, sorry, Sam. Um, Osborne and uh, Cameron had gone to Newcastle. We wouldn't have had austerity. If they'd gone, well, it's. Cameron said it. His happiest day of his life was when he got his place at Oxford, and then he remembered to correct himself. I go, oh no, it's when I got married. So obviously, it wasn't. Um, Can you say like his happiest day of his life was when he was a West Ham fan? Oh, no, it was no. It was a bit, yeah. <laughs> The, the only true supporter, what? yeah, Sorry. got to be nice, but in play, Rishi Sunak is the only person who actually supports the football team he claims, Southampton, but anyway, you know, genuinely uh, so, do. I know we're going to get over to the audience. <laughs> yes, for you. Even though we can't see it. We'll moment. see them for the questions. We, we actually can see the front row, but we don't know if anyone's there. So <laughs> if you've left, <laughs> we're kind of a bit pissed off if you're still there, that's great. I'm, so you have gone back to austerity. You've been back to austerity mm. before. You've gone back how many years later is it now? So 14 years after it was introduced, 10 years after the, the first edition of the book. And what's the difference that you've found? What? It's, I mean, on so many levels, things are unrecognisable, right? You, you can pluck any number of statistics from the air, be it homelessness, you know, be, be it childcare, be it the NHS, be it whatever. And everything is objectively worse. And it's just an awful political state to be in. There is just no way you can not notice the difference. Like I had American friends who came uh, about halfway through the austerity process, came to visit from California. And they're like, what the fuck happened? Like, we were here five years ago. And maybe two, street two people evidently street homeless on the Strand. And we come back now. We're going to the theater. And like, this is basically like San Francisco. It's just, and to them, it was very visible very quickly. When you're here, it's incremental. Um, and I think the most significant thing really for me is like all these years later is the degree to which so much has been dismantled. Um, and now it's become so normalized. Like, so now we get told, oh, there's a 22 billion hole. Oh, we can't fix this. Oh, we can't fix that because it's all so shit. You know, I'm sorry, it's truly shit, but don't tell me you can't fix it. What the hell did you run for in the first place? You know, like George Osborne comes out in a little video, like, like happy as hell because he says Rachel Reeves is doing everything exactly how he would do it. Yeah. Right? He said he's just not doing a single thing that he wouldn't have done or that he wouldn't currently support. So. And there's a podcast with Ed Balls where they yeah. agree with each other. Yeah. About because they're the grown ups in the room, and this is the only thing that's possible. So they get on now, right? So Ed Balls was supposed to be the one taking Osborne down in his role as Shadow Chancellor, Chancellor at the time that austerity was being introduced. Labour were in some kind of weird chaos where because everyone said, Oh, you broke the bank, and they're like, Oh, no, we don't. Um, but I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, Come on, if you're in opposition, do the job. But now we finally get them in government. Um, to change things, and apparently they can't really change things because everything is too shitty. Um, and I'm like, I'm sorry, you've had 14 years to prepare to be in government. So either tell us you're going to make people's lives better, or like get out of the business. Um, so I find that so that stuff really infuriates me, really angers me. I, I mean, okay, so shout out if you if you were relieved when the Tories got kicked out. <laughs> Shout out if you're bursting with joy and running like a lamb in the field at Labour being in. Ooh. I don't know. You know, it's like, 
I'm sorry, but you know, you're not in there to be technocrats. You're there to help people have a better life. You're there to stop children going hungry. Um, you know, 4.2 million kids in this country are in poverty. You know, huge proportions yeah. of kids from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. None let, of this is acceptable. Let, let me do one sort of slightly positive. Sorry, thing. I had to write a whole book about this because you yeah, couldn't you get will, me up to Okay, but a positive thing, right? Labour in the general election actually managed to get slightly less votes than in 2019, mm. but thanks partly to reform, That's more. Well, yeah, no. He always has to start with a negative. Start with a negative, but more, but more seats than ever before huge number of Labour MPs. They represent almost every constituency that is the poorest mm. now. Yeah. And half of them will go and do their surgeries on Friday. Half are snakes and suits. But at least half of the MPs will talk to their constituents on a Friday. And the idea that they're going to do that, and they can't hope to become a junior minister because you can't create that many fake junior minister posts, that you're going to spend four years talking to people, maybe giving them some money out of your own pocket because you're actually watching them starve, but you're going to go and do whatever the whips say for your non-career, for your non-impressive, for your loyalty, right? It's, it's, it, I just can't see it holding. With neither can, neither can I, but we're in a situation where they've got five years and it's not, you know, it's yeah. not a lot of time. And one of my worries is, I mean, it, it's, feels like a divergence, but it isn't. You know, there's a reason we had riots um, so recently. Um, there's a reason why it was the lowest turnout mm. um, since suffrage. Uh, so when you look at the top line figures, you think, yes, massive labor victory. But actually, there's a whole load of people in this country who don't vote, who don't feel a need to vote. And if labor don't give them a reason to and fast, then even people who turned up this time around won't turn up next time. And then you've got the right sweeping it up. And if the Tories think that they're going to you know, be able to go further right and take that off them, it's not. And yeah, I will do the misery bit because that's my job. <laughs> but um, but that, that's the fact of the matter. You, if we don't get this stuff fixed, I don't know where this ends up. But it's not a good place. Um, and we now, we now are in a situation where people who used to maybe feel relatively financially secure have been pummeled by the cost of living crisis, inflation, etc. And again, we were all told that that was, you know, like came from wherever. But I just feel that we have to like face up to the fact that their honeymoon is already over because they didn't have time to have a honeymoon. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, and I don't want to be reading headlines about maternity wards. Well, didn't they choose not to? Well, yeah, but it's kind of, yeah, they did actually, but it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I, as a journalist, I don't like the sort of Westminster bubble politics and the stories that come out, like what's the thing today, Sue Gray and her pay or whatever, stuff like that. I mean, I give a stuff whether a kid's going to school hungry. Um, and I know that there are MPs out there who care about this stuff Ooh. too, but the way Westminster operates and especially the centralized nature of politics in this country means that it's very hard on a local level to really truly make a difference. Um, so, you know, they just, I don't know, they have to get the shit together. If it's austerity light, we're, you know, screw that. Yeah. Danny, before we go over to everyone out there, I want to ask you, Danny's new book is, is Deep Injustice, mm -hmm. yeah? What's the difference between his previous book, <laughs> one of the previous 500 books, <laughs> this year, <laughs> <laughs> Which the deal is that you buy them all and you go down <laughs> with the ticket. Um, what's your, the previous book was Peak Inequality. Honestly, what's yeah. the difference between Peak Inequality and Peak Injustice? Oh, well, this, what's worse? <laughs> um, it's, this is a very nerdy, very nerdy bit, but, but slight, slightly positive. 2018 was probably the year of peak income inequality. Our last peak was 1918, actually. Um, since then, the pandemic makes it tricky. Pay awards have been progressive, most of them. Uh, so people at the top are getting a smaller percentage increase than people at the bottom. Uh, civil servants, the gaps between their pay is narrowing. People in the private sector, uh, the pay award in 2019 was 3% for everybody, for those working for BT. Now it's highest if you're on the lowest pay, because when prices rise by 30%, People can't survive on the bottom. Now, this last happened a century ago, and nobody noticed. The last time we, we began to become more equal, the last time the people who owned the huge houses couldn't afford them, and there were little signs, just tentative signs, that that might be occurring 
and what is occurring again so far. The injustice, though, is the longer you live with high inequality, even if it's doing that, the longer the, the harder the damage is. It's like living with high blood pressure. So yesterday I was in a school in Bracknell. Today I was with a series of schools in North London, uh, telling children that more children aged one to four are dying now than three years ago, uh, telling them that the average heights of children are falling, showing them the UN International League table on poverty, which is brilliant because two-thirds of the country has had massive falls in child poverty in the last seven years. Mm. Only a few have had increases. And at the top is us. And we've had the biggest increase of all, right? And it's, it gets easier, but it's not that easy showing children statistics about children in Britain. So the, so the injustice is we've known about this long enough. Mm. that it is no longer a maybe or a what or this is your political theory. Right? We did it. We made the children shorter. We made them hungrier. Um, and the question is, why are we still doing that? And why are our leading politicians not realising? Why do we have a debate in Scotland where Scottish Labour are playing with talking against the Scottish child payment you may not know this, but in Scotland, two out of seven children uh, get £25 a week. Their parents do not tapered. If you're a family of three, that's £4,000 a year extra. No child in Scotland need go cold or hungry at all. Scotland has made the biggest intervention in child poverty probably anywhere in Europe, probably since 1989. Not allowed to be reported down here. Because you're not allowed to think it's possible. Because Scotland's such a far away, different Nordic country next to Finland, you know, that you couldn't be like that, could you? Right? So, so the injustice is, the choice is there. Why, when you can actually have the ability to do this and stop children and their families being evicted by landlords and so on, why are you choosing not to do it when it becomes obvious? So it's angry. But I honestly can't believe we're going to get another two or three years of this because I can't see in whose interests. Mm. Yeah, I don't believe there's some kind of backhander from Rupert Murdoch of like, here's three million if you just behave yourself. It makes no sense to me. So I, I am actually positive. I just think they talked themselves into a hole mm. when they wanted to say that Jeremy Corbyn was evil. They're a tight little bunch, didn't talk to anybody else, didn't believe any advice from outside they're actually facing the reality of it very, very quickly and realising they could go down as potentially the worst Labour government ever, with the worst record of any Labour government there's been, if they don't do something different. And they're deciding right now, autumn statement, capital gains tax on second properties, mm. VAT on private schools is just the beginning, hopefully. But they, they're working out how to rebalance and they're making a choice. And the key question is, do they make the right choice or are they feeble? Yeah. We've got to open it to the audience. I think that's a brilliant, positive way to finish that. Uh, things are going to get me. better because Labour doesn't want to be the worst government ever. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Thank you. It's going to be a real challenge because we're opening it to the audience. Can, James, can we turn the lights off? Or is, I don't know if he's up there. Oh, let's see you all. Sam, is there a light switch over there? Uh, I can kind of see you. So if anyone wants to stick their lips on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You are there. Oh, 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 turn the lights off. Um, I'm not one of the experts that you mentioned before, but just on the optimistic note you talked about there at the beginning. Mm. Um, Gap yeah. is changing. What's driving that? Is that, is that a, a political party driving that? How does that happen? Agitation, and it's brilliant. Um, take civil servants. Since 2008, top civil servants, I realise there'll be some civil servants in the room, it's a lefty thing, but top civil servants, don't cheer, have had a 25% real terms pay cut. Junior civil servants, 12%. They're all poorer. It's harder to be a civil servant. But that gap between Sir Humphrey and the person in the office, uh, it's Prospect, the Civil Service Union, but it's people in offices just saying, it isn't right. It isn't right in my university. 
the from... It's not come from the political parties. It's come a bit from the unions, although the traditional right-wing side of the union is flat pen percentage increase. The most experienced old men must get the most money. Right? Our, our unions have traditionally been about differences and inequality. I was in the TEC once when the Qantas Airline Pilots Union celebrated being the vanguard of the working class <laughs> as they negotiated a quarter of a million pound a year for their pilots, right? But, you know, so unions have been about differences, but the unions are changing. Increasingly, they're not run by men. And of course, the majority of the low paid are women. So those pay deals, almost every single pay deal I've seen in the private sector and the public sector, even the newspaper, I can say because I'm not, Murdoch's newspapers, the pay deal for journalists there. I think it's below 60,000 this much. On above, okay, high enough money, but on above that, no increase at various times. Then uh, state pension and benefits, even under the last nasty government, up by inflation, which was higher. This happened in the 1920s and 30s. People didn't notice that most of the equality we won before the peak was won by 1939. Um, because we ran out of money, you couldn't take more at the top. And if you didn't allow people to have more at the bottom, they would starve. So it's tragic to be back into the hungry 30s now. Uh, but it's happening. And once it begins, university vice chancellors are generally flat. Mine's on 400K. She can't take, she, I know, she can't take anymore because it's so obvious, right? And that is the beginnings of a narrowing. Sorry. Next question. Harry. Yeah, I was kind of uh, interested because I know your work, Mary, that there's often a lot more differentiation that we, than we spoke about tonight um, for those who are adversely impacted. Mm. Um, so, you know, kind of got women, which then is kind of mentioned, of course, you've got people from racialized minorities. Mm. Um, there'll be other groups, people who are um, neurodivergent within that. Mm. So many different kind of groups who are um, adversely impacted. So I kind of wonder if you could say something about that. I think it'd be useful for us to hear. Yeah, I mean, I think, didn't the report come out, was it today or yesterday, from the Women's Budget Group, looking at some of this about, like, by 2027, 2028, um, Poor, the poorest women would be like some staggering like 28% worse off than they were in um, 2010 for people fr from uh, black and minority ethnic backgrounds, women from those backgrounds, you know, a whole other level. Meanwhile, men are only like, what, 2.8% worse off yeah. or something. I mean, these inequalities are entrenched and they run, they run through various different systems. And every single time I look at a piece of data on this, I'm like, what? I mean, how can people keep sustaining this? We've also, obviously, uh, women are the majority of carers. So uh, carers have really taken a hit during this time too. Um, they're not getting the support that they need. Um, but there's a lot of kind of domino effects that go on across these various groups. But for, for the whole time, they've taken the largest hit, not the people at the top. Um, and I don't understand, and Danny, please tell me to shut up if I'm talking shit here, but... I don't understand that when you've got actual millionaires in this country asking to be taxed more, mm. that that isn't a popular thing for Labour to say. Let's go after them. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't know. I just think that there's a discourse that takes place. It's almost as if it's two separate universes that we live in. You know, there's the people that have to live day to day, going to food banks, struggling, you know, you know worried that they're going to be able to make their rent or whatever. Um, and then, to my mind, there's often... Um, a sort of talking heads class of people that are sort of interested in these issues, but maybe have never experienced any of them. But I do take heart from uh, the activists and advocates on the ground that still do the job, still, you know, they're there on the front lines all the time, you know, taking people's problems on board, doing their best to provide for them. I think the unions have done a, a fairly good job in recent years of articulating arguments that politicians haven't. Um, and got people behind, even the notion of like, you know, the railways and stuff like that. But they're, they're, I mean, Labour's not wrong in the sense of every front, there's a fight to be had. But I think if we don't put it the, at the very yeah. front of that, the people who've been most disproportionately impacted, 
then, you know, we need to take a long, hard look at ourselves, frankly. Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, the unions are giving the government a year. That's why all the strikes yeah. are being called off now. Uh, but you mentioned the patriotic millionaires. Yeah. I could just imagine Keir Starmer do it, and you've got to smile when he, you know, rather than having the, t the normal two union jacks, oh, he'd God. have like 10. <laughs> but then he'd have the patriotic millionaires saying, and your patriotic duty as a millionaire is to pay more tax. And they could, they could do it, but they're nervous because we haven't done this stuff since the 1960s. But they can afford to be nervous. They're not hungry. Yeah. I think it's say uh, your patriotic duty is to give me more glasses. <laughs> yeah. I think someone else had their hand up. I'm closed. Sorry. Um, Margaret. In terms of the media, or yeah. in terms of, I'm, I'm just thinking because this is obviously a really very light minded yeah. issue. We, we want to hear this, and I'm not saying we don't, we, we're definitely learning. Yeah. But I keep thinking, you know, you're talking about the entitlement to afford to be like, oh, they're stupid. I feel like some of them are just stupid, like they just don't know. Mm. So, how do we help that? How do we find, you know, because yeah. you have your brilliant book, but how do we get it? I don't know. I mean, ask the editors who don't interview me. I don't know. I mean, seriously, it's really, it's a really difficult um, question to answer because there are, you know, that's the structure of the society that we live in. And, you, you know, you try to get the word out there. You do your best to get it out there. And there are lots of, like, amazing, like, individual journalists who do great stuff on this. You know, like Victoria Darvish who does great stuff at yeah. getting it out to a general audience. And I do think that more people are more aware than they were, say, pre-pandemic um, of the issues that are affecting people. I think the cost of living crisis weirdly did a job that the media didn't because people suddenly felt fragile who didn't feel fragile before. Yeah. So I think there's a, a shift in people's understanding of what precarity is. Like, well, then if my mortgage goes up by this much, well, shit, I might lose my house. And they might not have thought about that before. So I think that's one of the roots that these people began to understand. It may go some way to explain in shifts in certain constituencies and how people voted and that kind of thing. So I think all of that is indicative of people taking it on board. Where they're getting it from isn't always the sources that you might think they're going yeah. to get it from. And you've got the, the majority of young people are not touching any newspaper. Mm. Right? It's all online and things I don't. Now that Elon has taken Twitter off us, you know, um, your stuff will not be retweeted uh, if the algorithm works out your left wing. We don't know, if you're my age, what the online is. You just know uh, it is online. But you know, don't forget, 2015, 2016, half a million people joined a political party in this country, which was the largest political party in all of Europe. It, is, it happened. It is entirely possible for things like that to happen because they have happened. Um, and we're so defeated sometimes, you sort of think, oh, nothing can change. I can remember maths teachers in Surrey organising meetings uh, in 2016-17 because they were so sick of how hard it was to live in Surrey and the poverty in Surrey. Surrey has a higher rate of poverty than Scotland now. Um, and then getting phoned up by Labour Party headquarters going, why are you talking to that bunch of Trotskyists in Surrey? And I go, they don't know who Trotsky is. They're just maths teachers. You know, there isn't an SWP cell in Elmbridge, really. Right? So, and that happened. That energy happened. And you've only got to have a memory of a few years to remember. The largest mass joining movement on the continent happened in this country. Or look at what's happened in Scotland you know, with their determination to do things differently. So, and this is, this is us. I will also say that response, you know, I mentioned sort of the activists and advocates, etc. but I, I, I'll add to that because it goes back, probably a good place to close, Simon, because it goes back to your earlier question of differences that have happened over time and changes. So, like, in this country, like, the, the group of people that were firing off the warning flares right from the start where people, you know, were disabled people and disabled people's organizations um, who really understood that when the cuts started coming, they were in the firing line first. Um, and that is indeed what happened. 
and earlier this year they were sending up warning flares again saying we can't you know we can't wait for the election before we make these things no you need to know the consequences if you do this if you do that multiple going back to your point harry like multiple um aspects of these cuts like impact particular groups and we need to listen to those people because like every time they warn us we should listen frankly um because they're right every single time um uh so i'm going to end it there because otherwise i know like i want more questions he definitely wants more questions because mm. yeah um but we will be downstairs so you can we not have time for another no or one okay one if it's short and if he doesn't talk for 10 years <laughs> you can't talk for 10 years i won't um just want to you know first of all congratulate both of you on um excellent post semester great network and all the interviews and excellent research um you know the i just want to piggyback on on christian and yourself um you know there's a group of like you know, at least a handful of think tankers that you know joined this joined the talk thanks to the Labour party parliament Uh, what would you both, as experts, say to the say to them in the ten sectors, particularly with regards to the uh, recharge of it? You know what sort of action they can take as sort of real principled experts in Parliament, um, to sort of put, you know build their careers roots in evidence. Mm. Um, yeah. You go first, Danny. Very short. Uh, Torsten needs to say it publicly. Um, he's grown up enough. Uh, and that will shift him politically. You know, he's ran that foundation that's produced all the evidence saying it's necessary. He loses his personal credibility. He needs to say publicly that his party is wrong. Doesn't mean he has to vote in a way to lose the whip, but he has an authority. They love him on the Today program. If mm -hmm. you imagine having Torsten on the Today program saying that Rachel's got it wrong, you have a public debate. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think they've again they've got a grace period, but this this particular issue is too important for them not to speak up. And I think there's been like it's, it's really interesting and um, really good to see the reaction that the public have had to the retention of the two child limit because it's just I mean it's in government terms it's not a huge amount of money yeah. and it could lift hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty at a stroke of a pen. So I I can't understand why they're why they're hanging on to this. I hope. That by the time they get the conference and by the time they get everything else that they're going to say we've done the numbers we're going to make sure that this has changed and here's why and i wonder danny if it's people like torsten and those others who are doing the sort of backroom conversations inside saying look this just won't on a, an emotional level it doesn't stand up to the public but it, on the evidence it doesn't stand up so i'll wait and see but i'll be profoundly disappointed if they don't if they don't use their like years of experience to shift the dial on that within the party can I ask a really quick question before we finish, being around Rachel Reeves? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can we ever hope to tackle austerity when Rachel Reeves is Chancellor and she's famously said, we're not the party for people on benefits? Well, you know, that comes back weirdly to my last book, which is all about how they talk about this stuff and how they frame this stuff. Because, you know, you can only, these policies can only be pushed through if people are convinced that they're necessary. And this is how they talk about it. You know, the, I mean, I've been without internet off and on for four days, but even I've come across the stories that are like related to exactly that. Just people, people on benefits constantly being demonized. You know, the hardworking people trope just never goes away. What, like you think a carer isn't working hard? I mean, give me strength. So I just feel like they, that's an, a convenient mechanism for stopping people thinking that change is possible when it is possible. I do agree with Danny on that. It is possible. It's whether yeah. we're willing to do it. And I, I think Rachel would change her views if it meant she could keep her job. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Politics, isn't that lovely? And if she's looking the real Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been... It's not over yet. We're, <laughs> we're done. Our bit is done. <laughs> but this is where I fucked up. Sorry. <laughs> I told you I'm really useless, really unprepared. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this bit. Now we're getting a really <laughs> exciting bit where we have amazing comedy, which Mary will introduce. <laughs>